Well, this morning we come to a passage of Scripture, which is a lifetime favorite of many, said no one ever. I don't know anybody who says that last uh, 21 verses of Acts 19 just changed my life. There is no command here to any of us to do anything. It just tells us about something that happened. So why is it here? Well, we, we know because God told us why it's here. Like every word of His written word, it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. But it's different than when we have a, a, a very specific grammatical instruction that explains to us part of the character of Jesus and what He did on the cross, and, and therefore you must treat one another as He treated you. It, it, it's not one of those passages. We need to learn uh, about it by the examples that it portrays for us. So ask the Lord, if you would, to um, guide you in your understanding of this and to give you wisdom to apply it. Now, something we've seen through our first uh, 48 visits to the book of Acts is that the gospel changes lives. Oh, absolutely. It changes eternal destinies. But it also evokes persecution from those who reject it. And a corollary of that that we've seen in the book of Acts is that the church tends to thrive when it is persecuted. And that has always been the case. The pattern is not limited to the years that are chronicled in the, the book of Acts. There, is a, there was a second century church father. Why do we call them church fathers? Well, they were in the first century of the church or the first generations of the church. It means they were uh, a long, long time ago and they were pastors, theologians, authors, um, perhaps uh, uh, apologi apologists for the faith. One of them, better known one, was named Tertullian, lived in the last part of the first century in um, Carthage in North Africa. And he maintained that the more Christians were persecuted, and he used the phrase moan down, the more they would multiply because, as he said, the blood of Christians is seed. That little quip from Tertullian was later interpreted by better known ancient theologian Augustine of Hippo into the aphorism, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Well, we're going to see an example of um, some people getting pretty upset about the church. One of the ways that you can tell when Christians are being faithful to preach the gospel and then to live their lives in such a manner that they, they have a collective godly testimony is when the people in the places where there are Christians react to the impact of the gospel. Now, in recent days, we have seen a large-scale example of that, the thing which uh, right now is having the largest multinational impact. I'm happy to say for at least a few days it isn't a war. It's the Summer Olympics in Paris, France this time. And it is traditional for the host country to put on a show in the opening and closing ceremonies to highlight what they are most proud of about their country or what characterizes their culture or why you would want to visit their city. A good friend of Marcia's and mine had a lot to do with, uh, with the um, opening ceremonies for the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles, and it was, it was wonderful what he and they did. Well, this year, by design, with intent, the French promoters of the Olympics in conjunction with the International Olympic Committee included in the opening ceremonies a blasphemous scene mocking Leonardo da Vinci's famous portrayal of the Last Supper scene around the, the table with Jesus and the apostles. That scene, which I refuse to show you, uh, portrayed homosexual and transsexual characters, 
partial nudity and uh, commingling pagan deities with Jesus and the apostles. The stated justification for that despicable display was that it was intended to be an homage to Greek gods and Greek mythology, and it was to show an example of diversity and inclusion. And when it produced an outrage from many sources, me one of them, a, a, a pseudo-apology was issued uh, to the effect it said, we are sorry that many Christians were offended. And when you hear an apology like that, that's not an apology. That is a thinly veiled statement of arrogance. What that really meant was, we're not surprised that you ignorant prudes were offended by our ingenious artistic display of the truly best values that you all need to approve and accept. Go away. We're done with you. That was the message. Now, here's a side note, um, and you can well append that to uh, what we said last week about the poisonous words that start relational fires. Any supposed policy, apology, which starts with, I'm sorry you were offended, that's not an apology. That's a statement of self-righteousness that says the problem is you. You should not have been offended. A true apology says, oh, I'm sorry for doing something wrong or offensive. Please forgive me. Now, you may not have done anything wrong, in which case you need to sit down, you need to talk and, 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 have, a, and, and have a conversation. But uh, I'm sorry you were offended. That means you're the problem, not what I said, not what I did. Well, back to that blasphemous mockery of the Last Supper. Um, what do you think the reaction around the world would have been if they had depicted Muhammad participating in a homosexual or transsexual orgy? Or what if they had similarly pro portrayed Buddha? What if they had portrayed the Mona Lisa in a sex scene in front of the Eiffel Tower? What do you think the response would have been? Why select a famous portrayal of Jesus Christ to be the object of mockery. Is that truly what makes France a place that people should want to visit? I certainly moved it way down my list, on, or way down on my bucket list of places I want to go. Uh, is, is that really the mindset that lies behind the international camaraderie of the Quadrennial Olympic Games? No, it's totally out of character with the hundreds of years pattern. I read an interesting quote from a well-known talk show host. Most of you have probably heard of him, Dennis Prager. Uh, he was commenting on that, and he says, I am a Jew, not a Christian. Yet I found loathsome the mockery of the Last Supper, one of the holiest scenes in the New Testament during the opening of the 2024 Olympics in Paris. In fact, it is actually troubling to constantly read the words, many Christians were, are offended, as if only Christians are offended by France's and the International Olympic Committee's mockery of Jesus' Last Supper scene. Then I heard another fascinating quote. Um, it came from a really tall guy on our staff. Put, oh, he didn't say it, but he put me on to it. It comes from someone named Jillian Michaels. Ms. Michaels is a celebrity fitness trainer. You got to live in America to have a celebrity fitness trainer. She's a celebrity fitness trainer and entrepreneur. Uh, I understand that she is famous for roles on the TV show The Biggest Loser, one of the trainers that help people lose weight to gain ratings. Um, she is an open lesbian. She is married to another woman, and I confess I had never heard of her until I saw this quote in reaction to the Olympic debacle. Uh, Jillian, here's, here's what was written. Jillian Michaels went viral on Saturday with her message to her fellow gays about the drag queen depiction of the iconic biblical scene made famous <clears throat> by Leonardo da Vinci as part of the Olympics in Paris. Quote, 
We demand tolerance and respect, but then make a mockery of something sacred for over two billion Christians. But don't believe that pseudo-apology. This was intentional. This was designed, crafted, and aimed at people like you and me to let us know we are disregarded, totally dismissed, and we should be silenced. The best that we are good for is making crude jokes about us. You see, the world understands that the centerpiece of Christianity is Jesus Christ. So when they mock Him, they're mocking you. And it's intentional. And it's getting worse. It's now been, you know, one of the highest rated things on television in the last few weeks. Here's something that will probably sound quite familiar to you because it is quoted in Romans chapter 3 uh, to describe the universal sinfulness of mankind, but uh, this crossed my mind when I was reading about the reaction to the Olympic ceremony. Uh, Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3, the Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside and together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now, I mentioned the Olympics opening ceremony travesty as a, a sneaky way to insert a little comment, a la Romans chapter 1, that we are now not only going to have those things happening in our world, but it's going to be pressed upon us, you must joyfully, willingly accept and promote and agree with such uh, debauchery. Well, uh, it's not completely unrelated to the passage that we're going to investigate this morning. So let's jump back in our time, let's jump in our mental time machine. Oh, by the way, that's the only kind there is. Um, Let's travel back almost 2,000 years, as however you imagine it, a focus on the Roman Empire city of Ephesus in the province that they called Asia in what we now call the country of Turkey on the eastern side of the Aegean Sea. Uh, that's much closer, by the way, to the ancient home of the precursor to the modern Olympics, which began in, um, in Athens, and there was a, the Corinthian Games in, in Corinth uh, as well, both in that same uh, pattern of international uh, competition. And uh, that's where we're going to view what happened in our passage today. Um, there was a similar, by the way, but uh, similar but smaller event that was held in Ephesus uh, sometimes in the first century. But we're going to see a riot break out because of the impact of the gospel on the city of Ephesus. Now, there really isn't a logical outline for our passage, but we can break the words down into some chunks to help us see the flow of the text. Number one, Paul was planning. Number two, Demetrius was disturbing, as in disturbing things. Number three, people were provoked. And then finally, the crowd was calmed. We left off last time we were in Acts with an encounter in which a demon was vanquished. Remember that? And that led to even greater evangelism and repentance from sins in, um, in Ephesus. Now, refresh your mind we, from verse 17 through verse, through verse 20. This became known to all, that is the deliverance from the demon, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practice magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. In modern money, that's a lot. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Now, our passage begins with a comment from Luke about Paul's 
uh, reaction to that and his immediate long-term, immediate and long-term plans to keep spreading the gospel among the Gentiles throughout the Roman Empire. So we're going to dive in at verse 21. Now, after these things, after the bonfire, burning the books, there was this big display of um, repentance that went on there. After these things were finished, Paul purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Now, you may not have a perfect picture in your mind of the geography of that, but Paul is in Ephesus. That's on the eastern side of the Aegean Sea. If you wanted to go from Ephesus to Jerusalem, you better head southeast. But he said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem after I go to Macedonia and Achaia, which is north and west from where Ephesus is and on the other side of the Aegean Sea. Macedonia and Achaia were on the mainland of Greece, exactly the opposite uh, direction. But we're going to see that, and we're going to see more as we move on through Acts, and we're going to cross-reference 1 Corinthians and, and Romans. We're going to see that Paul did indeed go to Macedonia and Achaia to visit the churches there, and you'll recognize those names because he's been there on the second and third missionary journeys. He's going to go to Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, and other cities to strengthen the believers there, and he's going to want to collect an offering to help the suffering persecuted Christians in Jerusalem. And eventually, he's going to deliver that offering to Jerusalem uh, in person. And we'll see from other passages, he also made it clear that he intended to travel not only to Macedonia and Achaia, and then backtrack and go all the way to Jerusalem. He wanted to go all the way to Rome after doing that. And we're going to see even later, that wasn't the end of it. He also wanted to go to Spain. In other words, um, he was making some plans. And, and he sends a couple of trusted colleagues ahead of him into Macedonia to begin working on arranging for this generous offering for the Christians in Jerusalem. Back to verse 22. And having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered with him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Now, we know that Paul was always the leader of the team. We know that Silas was his right-hand man, right man. We know that they added Timothy to the team early on the second missionary journey. We know that Apollos served with them for a time. And we know that Luke has come and gone, and he will come and go uh, again a couple of more times. Uh, there was always a team, and we don't always know who all was on that team. But we know here Timothy and Erastus were sent as advance men into Macedonia. Now, we know Timothy. We know he was the one who had uh, one Gentile parent, one Jewish parent, and so he was ideal for uh, being able to be a, a work with a Jew, taking the gospel to Gentiles. Um, we saw his story back in uh, chapter 16, I believe that it was. He was a close friend and a very trusted colleague of Paul for the rest of Paul's life. As a matter of fact, Paul's final canonical book is a letter to, uh, written to, um, uh, to Timothy. Now, we don't know anything else about this guy named Erastus, except that um, he had a name that we don't relate to. It was a fairly common name, however. We know he was obviously a good guy. There are two other places where the name Erastus occurs, Romans 16 and 2 Timothy 4, but we don't know if that's if it's that same guy or not. We just know that he and Timothy were sent to uh, Macedonia. And Paul himself stayed in Asia for a while. This completed his three years that he spent in, um, in Ephesus. And we can learn from uh, his example of planning here, and that's what I want you to see. And by the way, notice it says he stayed in Asia for a while. It doesn't specifically say Ephesus. Might have been, and I'm sure that was his home base, but uh, file that thought. I want you to learn from his example of planning. Always he was thinking, what's the best use of manpower? 
What are the best opportunities to spread the gospel? How can we most <coughs> effectively in, encourage and strengthen Christians? He was always making plans, and he was always entrusting his plans to God to work all things together for good according to his plans. Learn from Paul, the Christian life is not just, uh, I think I'll get up in the morning and see what God does. No, no have a plan. Know, know what you're going to do, but don't think that you're in control as you make your plans. Paul understood Proverbs 16, 9, one of my favorite verses. verses. The mind of man plans his way. And the implication is, that's good. Uh, the mind of man should be planning the way, but the Lord, and you know that means Yahweh, directs his steps. Or another thing, it might have actually been fresh on Paul's mind because it probably had been written not long before this, and it would have been circulated uh, around to the places that Paul had been ministering. The letter, to James, the letter from James, James 4, 13 to 15 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. You got a plan for a business trip? Good, fine. He says, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. So, yes, make plans. And, and you have a great example here of a planner whose plans, by the way, got really drastically modified by God for His glory. So, why is this passage here? Well, one thing we can learn is from the example of the planning that went on. We'll also see the example of how the uh, disciples reacted to this situation. And this is going to illustrate for us the collective effect of faithful ministry over years. And it's going to show also the irrational hatred from unbelievers. And if we want to look at the big picture of the book of Acts, this helps connect the dots of fulfilling Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the remotest parts of the earth. And obviously the biggest part of that is the remotest parts of the earth. And so Paul keeps, keeps circling and circling and circling from all of these cities, knitting together the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile together, and he's going to make a big deal about that as he receives offerings from the Gentiles to help the persecuted Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. So Paul was planning. Now let's meet the bad guy. Demetrius was disturbing. This is near the end of Paul's three years in, in Ephesus, and we're going to see what effect his ministry there had had. Look at verse 23. About that time, about that time of the burning of the books and all of that, about that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. Remember, the way, that's a phrase. It occurs, I think, six times in Acts. Uh, it's, a, it's a description of Christianity, uh, Christians, the church, the body of Christ. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Uh, the way of God in 1826 of Acts was explained when Priscilla and Aquila taught Apollos more thoroughly about the way. In Hebrews 10, uh, Jesus is the new and living way into the holy place of fellowship with the Father. So this is about the Christians. Uh, there was no small disturbance concerning the way. Now, I like to write and speak in ways that aren't just completely plain vanilla. I think it's easier to help people uh, think things through. I get a kick out of Luke's pattern of describing things with understatements. No small disturbance. That's how he describes a riot that we're about to see. Uh, behind it all is the unseen manipulation of Satan. 
He, Satan was outraged by what we read in verse 20, that the word of the Lord was growing mightily and, prepare, and prevailing. So this riot was started by this guy named Demetrius who disturbed people and very skillfully wound them up into a frenzy. We meet him in verse 24. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis. Uh, these were those silver things that archaeologists haven't found silver things because when people find silver things, they melt them down and get a lot of money. We have found uh, stone equivalents of this probably. They say often it was Artemis uh, seated and a little you know, sort of a standard representation of this goddess Artemis. But he made silver shrines of Artemis and it was bringing no little business. There's my buddy Luke again. That means they were making a ton of money off of this. It was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. Uh, these he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, men, you know that our prosperity depends on this business. So these little silver shrines, and I'm sure there were different sizes and different prices, they were sold in and around the temple of Artemis. And there were probably up to 30 different shrines of Artemis around the Roman Empire. So they probably also exported these things. Uh, you and I might see them in a, something like them in a gift shop and think those are little souvenir trinkets, but it was a lot more than that. They were used as household idols. So you could worship your idol uh, even when you weren't at the temple. They were also used as votive offerings. Now, we don't use the word votive very often. That's where you would come and buy this thing to bring it into the temple and leave it there as a gift or a sacrifice to the goddess. You see some potential for recycling there? You know, make them, sell them, come back to the temple after closing time, gather them all up, polish them, put them back in the gift shop, sell them again tomorrow. Um, I don't know if that happened or not, but on the, on the uh, making of them, lots of money was being made. Now, you're probably more aware of votive candles uh, as are often used in um, Roman Catholic and Orthodox and other uh, churches. You, you buy the candles, you bring them into the church, you light them and leave them there, either in conjunction with fulfilling a vow or with the superstitious belief that that somehow enhances the likelihood of your prayers being answered. That practice is much more uh, known to us. Well, this guy Demetrius was apparently the head of the trade union, or perhaps more accurately, the guild, the, the, the fellowship, the professional organization of the silversmiths and all the other tradespeople who were involved in making these little religious items for sale. And it says he was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. Now it says he was bringing the business to them, so he was probably the coordinator of all this. You know, you get the orders would come in and then he would, uh, you know, he would, he would say to, you know, one guy, how many can you make by tomorrow afternoon? How many can you make? How many can you make? So he was the, he was the, the, the crux of the funnel of this process of passing out you know, the work. He was like the, the broker for the orders, I guess, would be what he was. And again, love Luke's wording, no little business. Lots of business was going on there. Now, in the fantasy world of Greek mythology, Artemis, this goddess worshipped in, uh, in Ephesus, was the, supposed to be the daughter of Leto and Zeus, and she had a twin brother named Apollo. She is usually depicted as a young maiden huntress, so like female hunter, that wears a skirt or white drapes, boots, and a bow accompanied with a quiver of arrows and a dog or a deer close behind. You've probably seen representations of her and didn't realize you were seeing representations of this Greek goddess. As I say, there may have been more than 30 shrines to her scattered all over the, uh, the Roman Empire, but Ephesus was the home of this 
really impressive temple of Artemis. It was one of the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world. It was made completely of marble, and it was one of the largest Greek temples ever built anywhere for any purpose. So pilgrims came to Ephesus regularly. Remember, we were talking about Corinth and the temple there to Diana. Well, she had the temple prostitution thing going on. Artemis didn't seem to have that. Maybe she did. I don't know. But um, uh, lots of pilgrims came to Ephesus to worship Artemis. And especially in the spring, there was an annual festival to Artemis. So it's not a stretch to think this riot may well have happened at the time of the festival because that's when there would be the most people in town that you could whip into the greatest frenzy to cause the biggest possible riot. And this trade in selling paraphernalia of Artemis to pilgrims, it was a major deal for the economy of Ephesus. So what you're going to see here is a case of non-Christians who make their living primarily from marketing idolatry, and they're going to unintentionally give testimony to how many lives have been changed by Christ in Ephesus in those last three years. And look what Demetrius has to say about this. Verse 26, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus... But in almost all of Asia, that huge um, uh, province of the Roman Empire, in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. You've got an unbeliever accidentally quoting perfect theology. He didn't realize what he was saying. These little trinkets aren't worth anything spiritually. They're just, you could melt them down for silver. That's the best you could do with them. Now notice he says, almost all of Asia. Um, that gives us a good idea that the churches in other predominantly Gentile cities were begun during the three years that Paul was in Ephesus. It may well be that Paul took short trips to other places. We know there was a, a, a sequence of seven cities that was a very well-known trade route by a lot of goods uh, traveled around there. Maybe he went to these other places. Maybe he sent others from his team to these other cities from time to time, like he sent Timothy and Erastus across the Aegean back to uh, Macedonia. And, and whether or not all of that happened, we know that Christians who traveled and did business in those other places would have taken the gospel with them. We're talking a huge influence here. For sure, the seven churches in the seven cities to which the book of Revelation is addressed are included in this phrase, almost all of Asia. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And we also know that there were churches in cities near those seven churches. At least Hierapolis and Colossae are mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. Those three years that Paul spent there had a massive impact. Well, Demetrius, Demetrius here is showing us three things. First, he accidentally attested to the life-changing power of the gospel as it spread through the region and walloped him in the pocketbook. Secondly, he was rather transparent about his alarm over losing income. That was far more important to him than the truth about God and the gospel. Money is more important than God and truth to people like Demetrius. And thirdly, he was very skillful at knowing how to whip up a mob. He appealed to the local sense of pride 
over their beloved goddess. You could see him manipulating the, the pilgrims. They've come so far to worship Artemis, and, and he's probably saying, I don't know, the way things are going, this whole thing might be shut down next year. Uh, he, 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 knew how to, he knew how to tweak things. Verse 27, not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. You see, this is straight out of Satan's regular old playbook. Blame Christians if something goes the way you don't want it to go. Nero blamed them for Rome burning. Several times already in Acts, we've seen the apostles or the Christians in general falsely accused of causing problems that they didn't cause. Now, in this case, it was true. The gospel was making such an impact that people were rejecting idols and turning to Christ. And as we saw earlier, those who turned to Christ were even going public with burning their magic books and confessing their former secret sinful practices. Well, Demetrius was doing his best to cause a disturbance, and he succeeded. He got himself a riot started. So, as we work our way through, Paul was planning, Demetrius was disturbing, and people were provoked. If you want to ignite a crowd, uh, well, first of all, you need a crowd, you need people, but spew out a slogan that they can chant that sounds like something everyone should want to uh, rally around. And we don't know how many tradesmen or members of the guild had gathered together there, but Demetrius managed to use his tongue to start a forest fire way beyond just the uh, craftsmen that were involved. So, verse 28, when they heard this and were filled with rage, they began crying out, saying, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And you can hear them chanting. Maybe they made placards, I don't know. Demetrius was very crafty in playing on his colleagues' fear of financial gain and trying to whip people up into thinking this is a real crisis. So he wove in their idolatrous religious beliefs and he seasoned the frenzy stew with a dose of local pride in their city to get the others involved. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And it went like any good riot goes. Verse 29, the city was filled with the confusion and they rushed with one accord into the theater. Now, the theater was a huge place in, in uh, Ephesus. Uh, the ruins are amazingly preserved. I would like to go there someday and see them. I hear it's, it's an astounding city to, uh, to see. But um, th this, this theater was a place that could hold over 20,000 people. And so, hey, well, if we're going to have ourselves a riot, let's go, in, let's go in the theater where we can, you know, we can make the most noise and get the most people uh, together. So they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. So there's two more of his team. Apparently, Paul wasn't in sight, so the mob dragged two of his team members into the theater. Um, but then a, a bit of calm and a bit of wisdom was injected into, the, into this uh, scene. And it actually was prevented from becoming life-threatening. Look at verses 30 and 31. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. Also, some of the Asiarchs who were friends of his sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. I sure would like to be able to have overheard some of these conversations. Paul was being just exactly like Paul 
always was. Hey, there's a crowd. It's a bunch of idolaters. They need Jesus. Pray for me. I'm going in. He was ready to go. But the disciples wouldn't let him do it. I just have to smile. Think about it. Somebody stopped Paul from doing something that Paul was going to do. Well, he was a humble guy. And apparently they persuaded him to understand that his life would needlessly be put in danger by being among an angry mob. It's, it's great to preach when you have a crowd, but don't foolishly put yourself into a situation in which you know that people are, uh, are openly out to get you. Um, and beyond his um, immediate Christian friends, the disciples, some others kept Paul from going into the theater. Now, here you get to learn the word Asiarchs. Uh, they were local dignitaries. It's interesting and it's not significant that it says they were friends of Paul. That means Paul had endeared himself to these government officials. He wasn't just an angry, prickly, fire and brimstone preacher, as we read about early chapters of Acts about the Christians, he enjoyed favor with both God and men. So who were the Asiarchs? Okay, Asiarch and then A-R-C-H as in archangels, like leaders of Asia is what the, the, the word would mean. Here's from uh, a wonderful explanation from the expositor's Bible commentary. It says, the Asiarchs were members of the noblest and wealthiest families of the province of Asia and were bound together in a league for promoting the cult of the emperor and Rome. Every year, an Asiarch was elected for the entire province, and additional Asiarchs were elected for each city that had a temple honoring the emperor. The title was probably born for life by the officers in the league, so in Paul's day, there could have been a number of Asiarchs at Ephesus. Well, these Asiarchs, who were his friends, kept sending to him repeatedly, don't go in there. Don't go in there. Well, not surprisingly, the crowd looked like it was going to get out of hand, and uh, turn on anyone whom they could identify as an enemy. Look at verses 32 to 34. So then, some were shouting one thing and some another. In other words, picture any protest you've seen in the last 50 years. All right? Pandemonium, silliness, people just mindlessly spouting what they've been told to say. It says, for the assembly was in confusion, and I love this, and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. Some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander. It was a Jewish guy. We don't know if he was a Jewish believer or not. Since the Jews had put him forward, and having motioned with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the assembly. To the assembly. So maybe he was trying to say something uh, sensical. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You think that would get old after two hours? Um, I shared a, week, a few weeks ago about a, a news clip that I saw a couple months back, um, a reporter went onto a college campus to one of these uh, anti-Israel, pro-Hamas, pro-Hezbollah rallies, and um, he put a microphone in front of a college student that was shouting slogans uh, against Israel and supporting Hamas and Hezbollah. And um, when this college girl was asked what they were doing there, she started to answer, and she kind of fumbled in mid-sentence, and she turned to her friend and said, what are we protesting? Uh, nothing's changed. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. It just seemed like a great big party. We're going. That's how mindless mobs work. 
It isn't about truth. It isn't about truth versus error. It isn't about right and wrong. It's all about whipping up emotions and causing a stir. And, you know, people say, we're raising awareness. That means we're making fools of ourselves in the, names, in the name of what we say we believe in, which we can't quite explain to you. That's pretty much what was going on then and what goes on now. Now, our time is uh, all but gone, but I want you to look at the interesting conclusion to this incident. This is the second time in just a few chapters here that we actually have um, some rationality and calm winning the day rather than Christians being attacked and killed. So this is point number four, the crowd was calmed. Now, the guy here that you're going to meet, um, the town clerk or the city clerk, uh, he was essentially the mayor of Ephesus. Uh, he would have been one who worked closely with the Asiarchs. He may have been one of the Asiarchs. We don't know for sure. But um, he wanted there not to be a riot because his position and their relative freedom within the Roman Empire depended upon having Rome's favor. And having riots break out and people get hurt, that's not good in the eyes of Rome who wanted to keep the peace of Rome, Pax Romana. All right, so just follow along the last few verses here. After quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, Men of Ephesus... What man is there, after all, who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven? That's part of the mythology about, the, about Artemis. You can look it up on your own. So, since these are undeniable facts, the undeniable facts is, that's a big temple. It's to Artemis. It's in Ephesus. It's a big deal to us. We all know that. That's what he means by undeniable facts. You ought to keep calm, he says, and to do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here, that means the, the guys that worked with Paul, who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. Now, that's an interesting insight, too. They didn't go around preaching anti-Artemis. They went around preaching Jesus big difference. Okay, so they are not blasphemers of our goddess. So then, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and proconsuls are available. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in the lawful assembly. Now we're told they had an assembly twice a week there in the city. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's events since there is no real cause for it. And in this connection, we'll, we, we will be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. And he was thinking, oh, I hope that saved my job. He just didn't want to get in trouble with Rome. Now, the guy was wise and calm. Make no mistake, he held to all the superstitious false teachings about Artemis and all the idol idolatry involved in that, but he kept a level, he a level head. He put the blame where it belonged, with the crowd and with Demetrius for causing a riot, but he successfully persuaded them to deal with their grievances through their own legal system. So again, there you, there you have it. If you want to pick a life verse out of those 21, have at it. You may cause no small disturbance, I'm not sure. There's no command to you here, but there's wisdom to be learned. Are you planning for ministry? Are you just waiting, hoping maybe something will happen someday? Uh, how committed are you to doing anything that's going to help spread the gospel? Um, are you thinking about 
trying to be wise about when to engage. As I said last week, I reserve the right and I actually have the expectation to update my pastoral advice about navigating a presidential election year uh, as, a, as a Christian. And you know, there's some battles that I'm going to recommend. Don't go there. Stay away from that theater. We'll get to that in due time. Are we watching out for one another like they protected Paul? Are we realizing that we belong to each other? We need to be identified as that group of people that represent Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, how we thank you for your word, and we always say that and we always mean it, because your word is truth, and we know that you sanctify us according to the truth, which is made known to us in your word. So, Father, whatever the needs of our hearts are today, we look to you to meet them. We ask for wisdom. We ask for the fruit of your Spirit to be evident in what we say and what we do and the attitudes that we manifest so that Christ will be glorified in us and through us to the world that so desperately needs to hear of him. And we pray in his name. Amen.